as the Lord direct us and, and keeps us. So very proud of our young people on today. It takes a lot to stand in front of a congregation and to sing out. It's one thing to do it in rehearsal. It's another thing to do it in front of people, not knowing what reaction you'll get. So just credit to our directors. Part of the reason I'm standing up here is because of my director. So I've been doing these Mother's Day poems since three years old, and look where we got. Look where we got. To Pastor Covington, to First Lady Covington, to the officers and members of Quinn, and a special shout out to my parents, you know, another reason I'm up here. I thank you all for this opportunity. They sent Sister Erica, who might be the nicest human being on the planet, to ask me last Sunday, she cornered me out there, and how could I say no to Sister? So you sent the right person to make sure that I would do this this week. So just thankful and honored to stand before you in this sacred desk. Now, one of the, my pet peeves, my father knows this, one of my pet peeves is anybody that is asked to be a speaker and then doesn't speak on the theme. So I apologize to all of the speakers that I have criticized while being out there because I am going to deviate from the theme if that's okay. So I've talked about a lot of people, got some repenting to do while I'm up here. So for those of you that have your Bibles, if you would just turn with me to Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. That's Luke 5, 17 through 26. And please keep your seats. We don't need to stand anymore. Is there some amens once you have it? All right, there's three amens. I'll take the three. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house and lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking, thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. I'd like to borrow a few minutes of your time this morning and explore as a subject, what kind of friend are you? Let us pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house one more time, Lord. We ask that you use each of us as vessels, Lord. God. Have your way in this place, O oh God. Remove me from the equation, Lord. Let Remove any stumbling blocks, anything that may get in the way of you receiving all the glory and all the honor and the praise. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In modern society, the term friend has taken on somewhat of an expansive definition. Social media has blurred the lines and confused some of us about what does or does not constitute friendship. You may log on, hopefully not while we're in here unless you're joining us virtually, and see whatever social media you're on and see that you have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of friends. But if we take the idea of friendship outside of the scope of social media, we find a little bit smaller groups. Now, many of us have levels to this friendship thing. They're the friends who really are just acquaintances. That's the person you don't have any issues with, you enjoy seeing. Hey, how you doing? You great, I ain't seen you. Why, you still out there doing? Oh, nice tie, I love your tie, excellent tie. The hey, how you doing, folks, the acquaintances. This is a person, again, there's no drama, there's no beef, but 
you don't even notice if they're missing at the event, and sometimes you have trouble remembering their last name or maybe even their first name. Just, my man, you good? You still all right? Okay. Glad you still over there? Great. Glad to see you still there. An acquaintance. Still friend, but really an acquaintance. The next level is, the, well, we got to get together. That person is one you call friend, but you just can't seem to get the calendar to sync up right. Maybe you have some history there. You know them from childhood, but you just can't figure out. I got to check the calendar. How about Saturday is good? Ah, I can't do Saturday. We got another church meeting on Saturday. Well, what about what about Tuesday? Ah, brother Everett said I'm missing way too many rehearsals. Let's look at let's look at Thursday. How about Thursday? We just just can't. We got to get together. And then there's the ride or die friends, the homies, the inner circle, the crew, the folks you call on birthdays, the folks you get into some trouble with, the folks you know who know you better than you know yourself. I'm talking about friends who were there when you got knocked upside your head by your mom and had to sit there and straighten out your shirt. I'm talking about those kind of friends, the ones, that, maybe I'm the only one, the friends who saw you get denied when you tried to ask your crush out. I'm talking about real friends who are there to bring that up anytime you get a little too high, they can remind you about that time. Remember that time you tripped and fell in front of everybody? Yes, I do. Maybe I'm the only one that has those types of friends. But I'm talking about the real friends, the ones you laugh and joke with that no one outside of you even understands the joke. Those friends, how many of us have them? The real friends. But all of your friends fall primarily into one of these categories. In fact, while describing these categories, you probably thought of some people who fall into each of these categories, especially the acquaintance, because you're still trying to figure out their name. What kind of friend are you? While we're thinking about what categories they all fall in, I wonder what category we fall in. In verse 17, we find that Jesus teaching in a home now filled to capacity. Now, I was not able to locate an approximate number in my studies. However, the Bible lets us know that there was no room inside or outside. Now, if you spend any time with me at all, you know that I cannot stand anybody's crowd. Now, even if I'm driving to the gym and I see too many cars, I will keep on going and have the nerve to blame it on the Lord like he don't want me to be in there today. Not with all those folks. And some of you all do that as well. I've been around too, so don't act like it's just me. So this home where Jesus is teaching is crowded. And in those days, a crowd was in, enticing. You know, we see crowds and different things. Eh, I don't know if I want to go in there. It's too many. I don't know if I'm going to go. But at this time, a crowd is enticing. You see a crowd, I say, hey, what's happening over there? I need to get a part of what's happening in that section. And it becomes a domino effect. So you see, well, as a crowd gets to 100, then it grows to 200, grows to 300, so on and so forth, because I got to see what's going on over there. There are no tickets for this event. This is a first come, first serve. There's no VIP section. You just got to get in where you fit in in this crowd at that home. But verse 18 reveals some men carrying a paralyzed man. Now, we're not entirely sure how far they traveled. It is not revealed how long Jesus was teaching, but what we know is that they carried their friend to be healed. And when they couldn't get him inside through the traditional means, they lowered him from the roof. Now walk with me <clears throat> through this scenario. Now clearly these weren't acquaintances, because you, you're not even fighting traffic for acquaintances. They're not get-together friends, because those folks are still trying to coordinate, well, who's going to carry what portion of the mat? And what time are we leaving? Should I bring the rope? You're going to bring, how are we going to, let's still get together. They're still in the meeting as we speak. No, but these were some real friends, some, some ride or die friends, some ones that were ready to carry you through the crowd. Friends who set out on a journey with one goal in mind, a healing for their friend. Crowds meant nothing, lines meant nothing, blocked doorways meant nothing, fatigue meant nothing. The only thing that mattered was we got to get our brother to Jesus. And I can't help but wonder if we on this day are trying all that we can do to get our brothers and sisters to Jesus. Are we unfazed by crowds, lines, and wait times? Are we so focused on getting folks to Jesus that we don't have time to complain about the hurdles in our way? What kind of friend are you? 
Now, I grew up in the AME church. I grew up under Bishop Wright and Dr. Covington as well. And the thing that I gathered from them is that any sermon or teaching up here should have three points. Now, they both have doctorates, so who would I be to come up here with not three points? The first thing that I would like to point out for you is that it's not always about you. Well, amen, somebody, okay. Now, any good friendship, and for that matter, any good relationship is about give and take. It's about compromise and sharpening one another. If you get your way all the time, you don't have a friend, you have a subordinate. If you're always giving but never get, you don't have a friend, you have a freeloader. If you're constantly learning from but never teaching, you don't have a friend, you have a professor. Friendship is give and take, push and pull. I mean, you ever met somebody, you really want to have people that have strengths in areas of your weakness. Because if you ever meet somebody just like you, you start to realize why there really should only be one of you. (laughs) Friendship is understanding that it's not always about you. Ask yourself the question of what would you be willing to do for the prosperity of a friend? If you truly love them, probably a lot, you'd sacrifice whatever is necessary to get them to a better place, to make them happy. You would do that, whatever was necessary. But what if your suffering wasn't even intended for you? The Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. It never said that the paralyzed man had faith. Sometimes we have to believe God a healer on behalf of someone else. They they may have given up hope, but you got to stay in that fight and stay prayed up for them and interceding on their behalf. You're sitting next to some products of prayer. I can attest that I'm a product of prayer. Had a praying mother, a praying father, a praying church family. And I am standing here today as a product of prayer. Not of what I did, but what God did through them. Jesus saw their faith. It's not always about you. My father told me this story many years ago, and I shared this in one men's ministry, so forgive me. You can pause it on virtual if you already heard this, but stay with me a little bit. He told me a story about a man who got the opportunity to see heaven and hell early before going. Now, as he journeyed down to hell, he found an expansive table, a great feast, but all these folks were starving to death. The reason being is that in order to eat this food, they had these large forks. And in order to eat the food, they couldn't turn the fork back to their own mouth. So they were standing amongst this great feast, withering away, gruesome death, because they couldn't eat this food. The man said, oh, I've seen enough of of this hell. Allow me to see what does heaven look like. So they took him to heaven, and he saw this great feast, this great feast, the giant forks again, but instead people were serving one another. The most selfish thing we can do in this world is to be selfless and to think in minds of what can I do to serve others. Your suffering may not be for you. The Bible teaches us about Paul and Silas who were in prison for casting out a demon and while in that jail decided that they would praise the Lord, that they would stay prayed up. The jail breaks in half. All of that happened so that the guard could ask, what must I do to be saved? The three Hebrew boys found themselves in a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar throws them in. Their faith let them know that whatever happens, our God can deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't, we still will not bow down to you. We still will not bow down to fear. Those of you biblical scholars know that Jesus met them in the fire, and they came out on his. Nebuchadnezzar asked, did we not throw in three? I see four. They were in the fire not for their faith but to move Nebuchadnezzar. Joseph was sold into slavery by his own family so that he could be positioned when the time of famine to make sure his family ate. Your suffering is not for you. Jesus was nailed to a cross so that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. Your suffering might not be for you. What kind of friend are you? Now, I'm not telling you to enjoy the suffering. 
But we love to pray the prayer of, Lord, use me. But then while we're being used, we ask, why me? Why did you pick me? So as you're going through whatever trial and tribulation you're going to, remember to switch your why me to, Lord, just use me. That sickness you're battling is for the guard in your life. That divorce is for the Nebuchadnezzar. The unemployment is so that you can be moved in a higher position to feed your family. It's not always about you. The second thing that jumps out to me was that the front row isn't always the best seat. Now, if there's teachers watching this, they think they know why I'm saying this, but I have a different, a different reason. The Pharisees, by the nature of their societal role in those days, typically had a clear view of the miracles and teachings of Jesus Christ. But my brothers and sisters, sometimes the front row seat isn't what it's cracked up to be. I'm sure that we all can think of scenarios where the front row is excellent, but sometimes it's not what it's cracked up to be. My buddies and I are big comic book fans, so this Thursday, we're gonna be at one this Thursday for the premiere, but we always have to race to get there to get the good seats. But the good seats, if you've been to any movie, is not that front row, because if you want neck problems, by all means, sit in the front row of the movie theater. But if you don't want neck problems, go a little bit further to the back. Now, we always try to get those early because, of course, the back fills up first. On a roller coaster, if you ride in the front row, you're going to go the slowest. Because when it goes over that hill, now, if you're not a coaster fan, you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't need to know about this. When it goes over that hill, it's dragging the back over. So if you want that need for speed, sit in the back. The front row is not what it's cracked up to be. What's all this coaster and movie talk for? I'm saying that sometimes, like the Pharisees, we can get a little too close and miss the miracles happening around us. We're so caught up in the protocols of the AME church, we miss the free flowing of the Holy Spirit. So caught up in the church calendar, we miss the opportunity to evangelize. So busy being in uniform that we forget to put on the full armor of God. The front row is not always the best seat. So how can we be a quality friend if we lack the ability to mind our surroundings? I once heard it said that we are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. When we dial in too tight, we miss the big picture. If those friends would have been fixated on the crowd, they would have never made it to Jesus. If they would have been fixated on the bottleneck at the door, they would have never made it to Jesus. If they would have been focused on that road rage issue on 275, they would have never made it to Jesus. But because they were focused on helping their friend, they kept on keeping on. They kept pressing their way through the crowd. Now, we ought to be those friends who get unfazed by obstacles and help get our brothers and sisters to Jesus. The Pharisees were sitting right up front, and their initial reaction was, who is this that speaks blasphemy, forgiving sins? But let me drop a little something to think about. What blessing did they miss out on while sitting in the front? Jesus wasn't at capacity. It wasn't like he could only do one miracle a day. So the Pharisees were in the right frame of mind or in the right metaphorical seat. They could have got blessings on blessings, healings on healings. They could have blessed others, healed others, empowered others, but they couldn't see the whole picture. And I'm wondering what kind of friend are you? What kind of seats are we sitting in? Are we Pharisees or are we friends? Are we sitting too close to see the big picture? And some of us are treating our churches like a Pharisee church. If I can just talk about what I'm talking about, Pastor, don't throw me off yet. We're treating our churches like Pharisee church. We are fine with a crowded church, but start getting a little uneasy and a little unsettled when they start lowering folk at the feet of Jesus. Who is this that speaks blasphemy? Who is this speaking in tongues? Who is this dressing differently, talking differently? Who is this changing the committee? Who is this singing my solo? Who is this parking in my spot, sitting in my seat? Who is this chewing gum in the sanctuary? Don't know the hymns, clapping off beat. Who is this? We can get so close and so singular focused that we aren't minding our surroundings. When I was 10 years old, we took a family vacation to Martha's Vineyard, and, 
And I decided that I was going to just lay on my back out in the ocean and just float a little bit. You know, very tranquil, very relaxing. I don't know how much time went past, but all of a sudden my eyes were opened up and I just stopped floating. And I looked out and I could no longer see the beach. And I panicked. One, I could not believe that my family let me float out <laughs> to sea. Two, the only thing I saw was a buoy floating out, which is signifies the boats can't come past this. I said, I floated far enough that the boats can't come out here. So my initial plan was, I gotta swim to that buoy because eventually I'm gonna run out of energy. I gotta get on that. I had no time to focus on the abandonment of House Mitchell. So I thought to myself, well, let me see if there's a boat behind me. So I turn around to look for the boat, and I was 10 feet from the beach. What I didn't realize was I had slowly turned while I was floating away. What I also didn't realize is I was standing up while being upset about my family throwing me out there. Couldn't believe it. But thank God I didn't swim out to that buoy. That was a, a distance. But see, when I looked at the big picture, there was no way that my family would ever let me float out to sea, despite what they think of me. They would still know there's some legal action if they let me just, just go out there to sea. But my brothers and sisters, I feel like that's what we do sometimes with the Lord. We're so focused on our situation and our panic that we realize, well, how can I have been abandoned? But the Lord never left you. You were just focused on the wrong thing. The Lord will, not, will never leave you nor forsake you, and he is not a liar. That's what the men carrying their friend knew. They saw the whole picture. Jesus wasn't going to let them journey in vain. The Pharisee only saw the buoy. They didn't see the big picture. What kind of friend are you? Are you a friend or a Pharisee? Are you putting limitations on what God can do? Lastly, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we all could ask or think. The Pharisees asked, who is this? And Jesus said, you think that's something? Check this out. It's not made clear what the friends' expectations were, but I got to believe they weren't expecting the homie to get up and fold his mat and just walk out. I just got to believe that they weren't ready for that. Jesus provided a miracle exceedingly and abundantly beyond what they could ask or think. As they carried him through the crowd, you know that there were some onlookers looking like, where do they think they going with this brother? And then they watched him as they took him up to the roof. Where do they think he going on the roof? They going to throw this brother off the roof? What? You're filled with crowds, hundreds of people. You know the naysayers were there. Where is this guy going? But how many of you know that you can't be focused on the naysayers, when you're doing the work of the Lord. What, are, what is he over there doing? Don't worry about what I'm doing. I'm in line with the Lord. And we think about what happened with those same folks when he came walking out. Well, I got to get in there. They throwing out healings in that house. I got to get, we got miracles in there. Why ain't nobody carrying me? I'm out here walking. Get me into that house. But I, I think about when I was studying this is, who was the healing for? Think about that for a second. The Bible doesn't follow the story of those brothers from that point. But these brothers had enough faith to carry their friend to the roof, lower him down to Jesus, and then saw him walk out. If they had faith before, what level are they on now? They're beyond mustard seed faith. This is sequoia tree, mountain moving level faith at this point. Because let's break this down for a second. The Pharisees saw this take place and were in awe. The other onlookers were in awe. The word says they came from every village, from Galilee, Judea, to Jerusalem. So this place is packed with representatives from everywhere. They saw a paralyzed man who made whole at the command of Jesus. But follow this. They could have easily said, well, it's a hoax. And that brother, he wasn't really paralyzed, man. He just walked up. They're trying to sell some tickets to the magic show. It's a setup. The rest of the, the Pharisees could say, oh, it's a setup. The crowd could say this was a setup. But the brothers who carried him, 
the friends who carried him, the friends who believed with their heart, soul, body, and mind that if we can just get him to Jesus, they witnessed the only thing they ever needed to see. My brothers and sisters, who was this healing for? As I said before, it's not always about you. Their faith helped a man walk, and his walk elevated their faith. Don't be discouraged when you're going through some things. Your burden might be my blessing, and my blessing might lift your burden. So church, our charge is simple. We got to carry some folks to Jesus. We got to be resourceful, creative, and determined what we're going to do to get folks to Jesus. We can't get caught up on what we used to do because our charge is not to hold on to the traditions of the church. Our charge is to bring and carry folks to Jesus. So I ask you today, what kind of friend are you? Are you going to find a way to bring those outside to the feet of Jesus? Are you going to walk boldly in your faith that your light so shines? Are you going to walk whatever the distance, climb no matter the height, lift regardless the weight? What kind of friend are you? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of hearing about a dying church from folk with no plan to revive, resuscitate the church. It's time for us to tap into the one who calls us friend. And I'm so glad today that he calls me friend, that he looks beyond my faults and meets my needs. I'm glad to have a savior who was willing to die for me, a blessed father who watches over me. But brothers and sisters, it's time for me and you to be better friends to God. So if we are going to be the friends God wants us to be, we must be able to answer that question that Joshua posed. Choose you this day. Some will serve money. Some will serve the AME church. Some will serve a building. But as for me and my house, we are going to start carrying some folks on mats. As for me and my house, we are going to be used as vessels. As for me and my house, we're placing people at his feet. As for me and my house, we're spreading the good news. As for me and my house, we're going to be friends, not Pharisees. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.